When Abu Talib died, this proved to be a very politically difficult time for the Prophet Sallallahu Why? Because Abu Talib was his, in our times, visa or passport to living in Mecca, right? Abu Talib was his protection. Everybody wanted him out. None of the elders of the Quraysh wanted him to be in Mecca. And so with the death of Abu Talib, he was in a very precarious situation. And so the Prophet Sallallahu decided in the month of Shawwal, basically the same month that Khadija dies, few weeks after Abu Talib dies, life in Mecca became almost impossible because there was nobody to really protect the Prophet ﷺ. This is when the Prophet ﷺ began thinking about leaving the city of Mecca. And the first city that he thought, thought of was the city of Ta'if. And so the Prophet ﷺ decides to leave and try a secret attempt. He doesn't publicize this. So he, along with Zayd ibn Haritha, ventured on foot so as not to arouse any suspicion. To walk up there is a day and a half or two days. And he presented himself to the leaders of Ta'if. And there were three brothers, Abdi Yalil and Mas'ud and Habib, the sons of Amr. So the Prophet sets up a meeting, tells them that he's in the town, he needs to talk to them. And so he presents himself to the three of them. And he presents the message of Islam and asks them to convert to this message. But all three of them rejected and they rejected in the utmost sarcastic manner. One of them said that if Allah has sent you as a prophet, I might as well tear down the curtains of the Kaaba. The second one said, A'udhu Billah. The second one said, has Allah not found anyone better than you? And the third one said, I cannot speak to you because if you really are a prophet, then you're too holy for me. And if you are a liar, then you are too beneath my dignity that I respond to you. So all three of them mocked him with the utmost mockery. And the Prophet stood up to leave and said, very well, if you have rejected my message, then at least do not tell the Quraysh of my visit. According to uh, the more authentic reports, he didn't just leave Ta'if right then and there. Rather, he stayed there for around a week. So he preached there for a week and we have authentic reports of some of the later Muslims recalling from Ta'if, later converts recalling, I remember the Prophet ﷺ preaching in Ta'if, in the Sukh, in the marketplace, and nobody responded to his call, i.e. nobody converted to Islam. And in one such incident, when uh, somebody might appear to have converted, this is what sparked them all. So even after the leaders rejected him, he stayed in the city approaching the laymen. So there was a potential of some people converting. And that was when the leaders of Ta'if panicked. And they sent the mob against the Prophet and They gathered together the riffraff, the ruffians, they gathered together, you know, the people who have nothing better to do. And they told them, they told these people to go and stone this man out of the city. And so here is when the story that we are all familiar with, that they came and they pelted him with stones and Zayd ibn Haditha radiallahu ta'ala an tried his best to protect him. He himself was injured from head to toe. But how much can you protect when the both are running? And this was when uh, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, bled and his sandals were soaked with blood. And there is no protection from an entire mob that is pelting them until finally they let him out of the city. And we have a beautiful narration from Aisha radiallahu anha reported in Sahih Bukhari that Aisha radiallahu anha said that, O Messenger of Allah, was there any day that was more difficult for you than the day of Uhud? And the battle of Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ is almost about to lose his life, the two or three wounds come to him and Aisha, uh, the Prophet ﷺ immediately says, Yes, indeed your people have hurt me a lot. And the worst irritation that I got was on the day of, he called it the day of Aqaba. Aqaba is where the stoning took place. This was outside of Ta'if. On that day, I presented myself to Abdi Yalil ibn Abdi Kulal. They didn't respond to me the way that I wanted. And so I found myself in grief and sadness. And I didn't notice where I was until I reached Qarna Tha'alib. Qarna Tha'alib is a place around 7-8 kilometers outside of the city of Ta'if. We in our times would call this being in a state of shock. And that is where we learn of the famous story as well that uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he saw some shelter, he saw some shade, he sat under a tree that was next to uh, a, guard, a garden wall. It was a wall that was uh, the garden and he did not know that this garden belonged to uh, Utba ibn Abi Shayba, that was a distant, basically his father's second cousin. And he was where the Prophet ﷺ sat down and he said that famous dua 
which is mentioned in uh, the Sirat of Ibn Ishaq. Allahumma inni ashku ilayka dha'fa quwwati wa hawani ala nas. Oh Allah, to you I complain of my weakness and my lowliness before men. Anta arhamur rahimeen wa anta rabbul mustadhafeen wa anta rabbi. You are the most merciful of all those who have mercy. And you are the Lord of those who are humble. And you are my Lord. Ila man To whom do you leave me with, O oh Allah? Who else can I go to other than you? Ila ba'idin yatajahamuni. To somebody who's a stranger who is going to treat me harshly. Am ila qaribin malaktahu amri. Or to a close relative whom you have given power over me. Ay Abu Lahab. Illam takun ghabbana alayya fala ubali. As long as you're not angry with me, then I don't care. Except for the fact that your protection from tribulation, your ease and comfort, this is more easy for me. Allahumma inni a'udhu bi wajhik. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in your face. Your face, that is the source of all of the light of that uh, releases or that gets rid of the darkness. And because of which all of the affairs of this world and the next are rightly guided. I seek refuge in your face that your anger comes down upon me or your wrath envelopes me. It is your right to criticize size until you are content. And there is no power or change except with you and through you. So the Prophet says this dua under a tree next to a wall and little does he know that this wall actually belongs to his distant uncles Utba and Shaiba ibn al-Rabi'ah and they had seen the Prophet being pelted from the distance. They had seen the blood coming from him. They had seen him sitting down under that tree and they felt pity for their blood relative. This was their cousins or their second cousin's son. This is a Qurashi, fellow Qurashi. And so they decided to gift him some of the fruits of their orchard. And so they sent their servant whose name was Addas. And Addas was an Iraqi Christian. And so Addas comes to him and says, this is a gift from my master. So the Prophet took it and he said, Bismillah. And he began eating. Addas was shocked and he goes, what is this phrase, Bismillah? And so the Prophet said, this is uh, something that my Lord has taught me. And where are you from, O Addas? Addas said, I am from Nineveh. So the Prophet smiled and he said, from the city of Yunus ibn Matta. Addas was shocked. And he said, how did you know Yunus ibn Matta? Nobody in this whole land has ever heard of Yunus ibn Matta. And the Prophet said, how do I not know Yunus? He is my brother and I am his brother. We are both prophets of Allah. And so Addas instantaneously began kissing the feet of the Prophet as the Christians did to respect their elders and their, and their rabbis and their priests. And he believed in him right then and there. There is a symbolism here that Ya Rasulullah, even if your own people and the people that are closest to you, Ta'if and Makkah, have rejected you, know Ya Rasulullah that you are upon the truth. And even a person from the furthest world, from the furthest corners of this land, even these people will recognize your truth and a time will come when his people as well, the people of Iraq and the people of all of those faraway lands will recognize this, that even if the near have rejected you now, the far shall accept you soon. The two masters are staring in shock that they send their slave with grapes and all of a sudden he is kneeling and kissing and touching the Prophet ﷺ. And when he comes back, they tell him, Wayhak, woe to you. Why are you kissing his hands and his feet? And Addas said, Oh my master, there is no one on earth who is better than he is. For he told me things that only a prophet could know. And they said to him, Oh Addas, he has bewitched you from your religion. Your religion is better than his religion. And later on, they tried to force Addas to fight in the battle of Badr. And Addas said, You want me to fight that man who was sitting under the trees? Wallahi, the mountains could not harm him. And he refused to obey his own masters. And his own masters met their death at the battle of Badr. We go back to the one of Bukhari and the Prophet ﷺ said, When I reached Qarn al-Manazil, i.e. at this stage now, فَرَفَعْتُ رَأْسِي I saw something in the heavens, I looked up. فَإِذَا أَنَا بِسَحَابَةٍ قَدْ أَظَلَّتْنِي There was a cloud that had given me shelter. And in this cloud, there was Jibreel. And Jibreel said to me that, Ya Muhammad ﷺ, Your Lord has heard what your people have said to you and their rejection of you. He has sent me 
me with the Malak or the angel of the mountains to put at your disposal and to do with as you please. Then he heard another voice and he said, I am the Malak al Jibal. And the Malak al Jibal, Salam alayhi. He said, Salam to him. And then he said, Ya Muhammad, sallam, Qul ma shi'ta. Say what you want. I am at your disposal. In shi'ta and utabbiq alayhim al akhshabain. Ta'if is between two large mountains. If you want, I can squeeze the city in between the two mountains. The Prophet said, No, well, no, don't do this. Rather, I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will extract from their progeny, from their children, those who will eventually worship him without associating partners with him. The miracle, brothers and sisters, is not that Allah sent the angel down to be at his service. The miracle is not that the angel says, I can crush the two mountains. No, Allah, this is not the miracle. The real miracle is that the Prophet after such a rejection and after this bleeding and after this physical and emotional trauma and stress still has the mercy in his heart to say, Bal, no, don't do that. If this is not Rahmatan Lil Alameen, then what is Rahmatan Lil Alameen? And he makes dua that one day this city will be a Muslim city. And indeed, our Prophet himself was the one who barely 10 years after this incident reconquered Ta'if and many of the people at that city alive at the time eventually converted to Islam. If he had willed, there would be no city. But subhanAllah, instead of that, and I have been to Ta'if myself, the very place where the Prophet ﷺ was stoned, that very place has been made into a masjid where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped. On the way back to Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ camped outside of Mecca and as was his habit, he stood up to pray tahajjud. And he began reading his Quran in tahajjud. What happened is what Allah mentions in Surah Al-Ahqaf. When we caused a group of jinn to come pass by you and they started listening to the Quran. When they were in your presence and they heard this Quran, they all said, quiet, listen. If the world of men had rejected him, the world of jinn says, quiet, listen. If the world of the people of Ta'if had mocked him, the world of the jinn stopped dead on its track. Once you finished your tahajjud, so they listened to the whole tahajjud of the Prophet It was a real tahajjud, two, three hours long, minimum. And when they finished, they They were transformed not just into Muslims, they became warners and scholars and da'is to their own people. And they returned all the way back to their people. And they said, They said, O our people, we have heard of a book that has come after the book of Musa. And it is calling people to righteousness and guidance. O our people, respond to the caller of Allah and believe in him and this was the first batch of jinn converts to Islam and these very people they went to their people and their people converted to Islam and they came back to Mecca while the Prophet was in Mecca and they wanted to learn Islam from him Ibn Mas'ud was asked by his student al -Qalam, was anybody there when the Prophet experienced the Laylat al-Jinn it is called the Laylat al-Jinn there's two reports the first one is in Sahih Muslim and it goes as follows Ibn Mas'ud said no nobody was there. One night we were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he disappeared. And we started looking for him everywhere. Fil was shi'ab. And we could not find him. And we thought that he had been kidnapped or assassinated. And we spent the worst night of our lives. Until when the morning broke, we saw him coming from the direction of Ghari Hira. So they said, Ya Rasulallah, where were you? We missed you. We couldn't find you. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Da'ani atani da'in min al-jinn. That one of the callers of the jinn came to me, telling me there's a congregation waiting for you. So I went out to meet with them and I recited Quran to them. He said, do you want to come with me to see the remnants? They said, of course. So Ibn Mas'ud said, he walked with us and he showed us their campsite. He showed us the fires that they had lit. So he showed us the after effects of that, even though of course the Sahaba were right there, they didn't see it because this is the world of the jinn. This is the version in Sahih Muslim. There's another version in Mustadrak al-Hakim and that is that the Prophet once while he was in Mecca, he said, whoever wants to come with me to be with the 
matter of the jinn, Amr al-Jinn can come with me. So Ibn Mas'ud said, I was the only one who went. And we started walking until we came to a valley outside of Mecca and he drew a line in the sand, the Prophet him. And he said, sit here and do not move from this spot until I come back. So the Prophet continued walking and he recited Quran and black clouds started appearing around him until he disappeared into those black clouds until I could hear him but I could not see him. And there was a, a whirling of clouds around him until it just disappeared in front of my eyes. And one group of these clouds remained in the distance but the Prophet was gone. I couldn't see him. So basically the group split up. Some remained and some took the Prophet somewhere. And I waited until Fajr. And then I saw the Prophet come back and when he came back he said where is the other group of jinn? So Ibn Mas'ud pointed to the clouds in the distance and he said it's over there. So the Prophet gave them some bones and some animals dung and he told them that these bones would be food for them and the animal dung would be food for their animals and therefore this shows us by the way that even the jinns have animals so there's something called animal jinns as well now this portion of the hadith is mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim and in many different portions and that is that the Prophet said that the jinn basically asked him where will we get our food from so the Prophet said every bit of bone that my ummah eats and mentions Allah's name over every bone shall become flesh for you so whatever meat that we eat. Well, we say Bismillah or we sacrifice an animal, we say Bismillah, we eat the meat, but then there is another type of meat in another world beyond our senses where the Muslim jinns can eat of this meat. The reason why the jinns are asking this is because the shayateen eat that over which Allah's name has not been mentioned. And so the shayateen eat haram meat basically. So the Muslim jinn said, now that we've accepted Islam, where will our food come from? So the Prophet gave them the counter that from now on, any Muslim who eats anything, that food will become food for you. And the animal droppings of the animals that the Muslims have, they will become, they will be transformed into the food for your animals. How did the Prophet re-enter Mecca? We already said that by turning his back and walking out, he's basically cutting off officially by walking out of Mecca and disappearing for 10 days. Khalas, the fate is sealed now. This is basically exit, no, no re-entry. His adopted son, Zayd, asked him, Ya Rasulullah, how are we going to enter Mecca now that you have been expelled from it? He said, Ya Zayd, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a way out for us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help his prophet and make his message supreme. And the Prophet then began sending emissaries to two or three allies within Quraysh that he thought might be sympathetic to his call. The first of these was Al-Akhnas ibn Shuraiq and Al-Akhnas ibn Shuraiq sent a message back saying that I'm not in a position to give you protection. So he sends it to Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr sends back that I am Banu Amr, uh, Amr ibn Lu'ay and Banu Amr ibn Lu'ay have never given protection for somebody from the Banu Ka'ab. I, I don't want to start a precedent. And then he sends it to the third one and that is Mut'im ibn Adi. Mut'im ibn Adi is the chieftain of the Banu Nawfal ibn Abd Manaf. So Mut'im ibn Adi, he is sent a message. The Prophet is saying that will you give me your ajid, your protection. And so Mut'im doesn't just send a messenger back. Mut'im tells his sons, he has four sons, go arm yourselves, put your armor on, get your weapons and go and follow the messenger back and come as armed guards, guards guarding the Prophet Sallallahu and bring him straight back to me. And Mut'im went to the Kaaba to receive him. And he said to the Prophet Sallallahu do tawaf, I'm waiting for you. So the Prophet did tawaf, got armed. The guard is doing tawaf with him to guard him, right? And then when he finishes, everybody's wondering what is going on here. Mut'im stands up and he says, O oh, people of Mecca, I have given my protection to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Sufyan stood up and said, are you his follower or are you just giving a protection? So he said, no, I'm not a follower. I'm just giving protection. Abu Sufyan said, in that case, we shall accept it. And so the Prophet ﷺ remained under the protection of Mut'im for another year and a half, less than two years. And he remained in the protection of Mut'im and he kept on figuring out another way, another way, another way until finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened for him the door of Medina 